All right, our next speaker is Dr. Rick Latinen. Originally from Minnesota, Rick has studied Dr. Rick has studied amphibians and reptiles in the U.S. and abroad since 1995. After an undergraduate degree in biology from Winona State University in Minnesota, he got a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Minnesota and a Ph.D. in ecology and evolutionary biology from the University of Michigan. Currently, he is a professor of biology at the College of Worcester, Ohio, where he has been since 2003. In his spare time, he reads, plants trees, watches birds, and is raising a dog, two cats, four hens, and two humans. All right, and now I'm going to pass it over to Rick with his presentation on does invasive species control have unintentional negative impacts on salamanders? Take it away, Rick. Thanks a lot. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Awesome. Um, I don't know if you can see me or not, but I, I, I mentioned uh, that I, I'm a birder and there's a pair of red shouldered hawks that are thinking about making a nest out my uh, office window here. So if I look or seem distracted, that might be why. <clears throat> Pretty exciting. Uh, well, thanks for joining me. Um, you know, on a, I don't know how it is on Long Island right now, but it's like 60 degrees here, right? You know, being on Zoom in such gorgeous weather, I think you you all need a special medal or something. <clears throat> um, but yeah, let me jump right in. Um, I like to start with acknowledgments because otherwise, you know, important folks uh, sort of just get swept to the end, and sometimes we don't even get to the end. So, this project that I'm going to be telling you about is mostly the work that was done by three undergraduate students uh, of mine here at the College of Worcester. Uh, Blake, Haley, and Alexa, who are now long graduated, but they did a lot of the hard work uh, with this. And, you know, any project takes, takes permissions and funding. And so these are kind of the institutions that were instrumental there. <clears throat> um, in case you're wondering, we're about an hour south of Cleveland here. Worcester is a, a small little town of about 25,000 people. And I've been here for a while. So a lot of this early stuff in the presentation is, you know, not going to be anything that um, any of you don't know backwards and forwards, but we do need some context, I guess, for everything. So we know that in the Anthropocene, the, our biodiversity is is under many grave threats. Um, we're we're all kind of doing the things that we do because we care about that, and we and we want to help our native biodiversity you know, survive into the future. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, some of the great threats to biodiversity around the world, uh, probably probably the biggest one, um, in my opinion, is just simple habitat loss and, and fragmentation of the remaining habit, habitats that are there. Um, I did all my dissertation research in Madagascar and boy, is habitat loss just on, on full display there everywhere you look. Um, <clears throat> But even here in the U.S., uh, you know, as as the introduction mentioned, I, I grew up in Minnesota and went to school there. Um, you know, the tall grass prairie, which is out in western Minnesota, you know, it's like less than one tenth of one percent of the tall grass prairie that once existed still exists. So sometimes the level of habitat loss that we have is just, you know, super extreme. <clears throat> and of course, climate change you know, is always going to be kind of in, in the top three here um, as, as a huge threat to biodiversity. But then, of course, more directly, the interest for us uh, here today are invasive species. Um, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of synonyms out there, you know, um, non-native species, introduced species, I mean, call them what you will. We all know we're, what we're talking about there. Um, I'd like to, you know, at least give a bit of a deep time perspective here. I'm, I'm, you know, partly an evolutionary biologist. And, you know, if we think about, you know, way back in the good old Permian days, when, you know, all the major continents were sort of in one huge landmass, you know, there was less biodiversity on the planet uh, than there is now. And really the whole history of the earth um, in the last quarter of a billion years is sort of the fragmentation of Pangaea uh, as those continents, you know, 
have drifted apart over the, over that period of time. And obviously, evolution has continued to go on. And, and, and since those huge land masses that once were part of uh, this big supercontinent uh, drifted apart and have developed their own kind of unique uh, floras and faunas, um, you know, biodiversity has been increasing, um, partly in response to kind of the lack of connection among all the major land masses. But what humans have done over the last couple of hundred years, and especially over the last, you know, maybe five decades or so in particular, as, you know, transport and human populations have, have become so large, you know, we're sort of recreating Pangaea in a way. Um, we're sort of knitting the continents back together. I mean, not directly, of course, but by bringing things, you know, from Africa and Asia and South America here. And, and you know, because we're always so focused on, you know, invasive impacts in our local areas, I always like to remind my students that, well, there's lots of uh, North American natives that have been introduced elsewhere that are problematic in other parts of the world. You know, the American bullfrog, the Eastern gray squirrel, for example, um, that are huge problems in other parts of the world. And so it, you know, it works both ways. Um, so we care about these, uh, these, I guess, newcomers. Um, and some of these newcomers, of course, have been around for hundreds of years um, and have, in some cases, insinuated themselves, you know, fairly innocuously in ecosystems and others are more recently arrived. Um, but, you know, the ones that, that get our attention and the ones that get most of the press are the ones that have a lot of negative effects on our native species. And of course, there are many of them. Um, but the ones that don't get as much press are some of those that actually have pretty neutral impacts or in, in a handful of cases anyway, have been shown to actually have positive impacts on some native species. I was just uh, giving a lecture the other day to my students in my vertebrate zoology class, um, you know, here in Ohio, you know, on the border of Lake Erie, uh, you know, we a lot of our invasives that we talk about are aquatic ones. Um, you know, some of the, uh, you know, plants, uh, aquatic invasive plants, but also the zebra mussel, of course, and quagga mussel, and the more recent one, you know, sea lamprey. Um, but the most recent one that's gotten a lot of press is the round goby, which uh, arrived in Lake Erie in 1992, to the best of our knowledge, somewhere in that area. Uh, but the round goby, despite some negative impacts on some of our native uh, fish species, has actually almost single-handedly brought the Lake Erie water snake off of the endangered species list because it now has a ton more food than it ever did before. So it's just a good reminder that, um, you know, we can't just say invasive species bad kind of in, in all conceivable situations because, you know, life is complicated and there are exceptions. <clears throat> Oh, but most of them do have negative effects on native species. What do we do? Well, you know, what we do is try and control and manage them. I mean, I would argue that, you know, surveillance is maybe a part of things that we don't do as, as good of a job at because, you know, those initial introductions when things are still, you know, just a small population in one or a handful of locations, I mean, we actually do have a chance of eradicating them when they're at that stage. But of course, once they spread to, you know, hundreds of populations over large um, areas, you know, there's really no chance to eradicate them, but we can control uh, and manage them. And that's what we often choose to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's expensive. Uh, this paper um, that I found uh, online, you know, preparing for this lecture, um, estimated that invasive species control in North America alone is about 21 billion a year in US dollars. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty big uh, expenditure. Um, but I'm guessing that, you know, sort of the costs, if we didn't control them would maybe be even larger, although some of these things are hard to put a dollar amount on. And, you know, there's a variety of evidence that at least in a lot of cases that, that the control and management that we do for invasive species um, can be successful um, and that there are good biodiversity outcomes to our native species uh, in response to, to that management. <clears throat> so, you know, it costs a lot of money, but I think in a lot of cases we are doing some good. And I should mention um, before I get too deep into this, I mean, 
I uh, you know, teach and do research here at the College of Worcester, which is a small liberal arts college uh, here in Ohio, but I also serve on the board of, of uh, our biggest um, county park um, in my area, and so have a lot of, I guess, interest and experience in sort of the ground level uh, management issues as well, um, <clears throat> not just kind of the theory and, and big picture stuff. Um, so I study primarily amphibians, and so that's what led me to this project. Um, and, and the question here is that all this control and management of, of invasive species that, again, we have, at least in, in, in a number of cases, good evidence are, are helping um, our native species, but are they having some impacts that we don't know about or don't think about? Um, is there some collateral damage to the control and management that goes on? <clears throat> um, in my area, um, and, and I, since I work a lot on, on salamanders and to some extent on frogs as well, um, I'm mostly working in forested ecosystems. Almost all of Ohio was historically forested. Um, <clears throat> and some of our biggest invasive plants in our local forests are things like privet, you know, the center photo there and uh, burning bush in the upper right and honeysuckles of various kinds in the, in the lower right. And of course, garlic mustard uh, there in the, in the lower left. And a somewhat more recent one for us anyway is oriental bittersweet uh, up in the upper left. Of course, those are, you know, just a drop in the bucket, but those are some of the most problematic ones for us, especially like in the understory um, of, of our forests. We, in a lot of our forests, we really don't have a lot of, um, with some exceptions, we really don't have a lot of native understory plants that are doing well. They've been crowded out by by privet, honeysuckle, and burning bush primarily. Um, and so our our local parks um, have been, you know, working at controlling uh, and removing some some of these invasive species. And we've taken that as an opportunity to see what effect that invasive plant removal um, has had on our local salamander populations. <clears throat> uh, so the question that, that, that we were asking, you know, me and my students was what effects, if any, does invasive plant control have on non-target organisms? And the non-target organisms that we'll be primarily focusing on here while really exclusively focusing on here are, are terrestrial salamanders. <clears throat> um, a little bit about salamanders. Um, they're super cute. Um, they're also super abundant um, because a lot of salamanders and most of the salamanders that we'll be focusing on here today are, I, I, I call them terrestrial salamanders because they're relatively small bodied. Most of them don't have a larval stage, uh, meaning that they don't have an aquatic part of their life cycle. Eggs are laid in the soil, like in rotten logs, moss, et cetera. The eggs hatch into miniature versions of the adult straight out of the egg and they grow into the adult form and there's no aquatic larval stage. Of course, we have lots of salamanders that do have an aquatic larval stage, but largely those are not the salamanders that I'm gonna be focusing on uh, here today. So in terms of uh, forests in, in Eastern North America, um, these terrestrial salamanders can be kind of crazy abundant. Uh, there's an old study from the 70s from the Hubbard Brook area in, I believe it's in New Hampshire. Um, would they really, really were the first people to kind of have a good, reliable estimate of population density of some common salamanders. And, and they were working on, uh, among other things, the, the Eastern redback salamander. And that's what we have here. As you may know, Eastern redback salamanders are often striped with that, that red red stripe on their back, and it can vary, you know, from you know almost a gray to, to yellow, orange, red. It's most commonly red, but sometimes it's completely unstriped. Uh, it's still an eastern redback salamander. It's just the so-called unstriped morph. <clears throat> um, but the study in New Hampshire gave a pretty solid estimate of about seventeen hundred salamanders per hectare. A hectare is about an acre and a half. So the park that I do a lot of work at and serve on the board of uh, here in our area, which is about 500 acres, you know, 
doing a little mental math here, um, <clears throat> you know, we're probably talking about a few hundred thousand of these redback salamanders just in that one single park. Uh, so you think about that, like on a whole area of Eastern North America basis, we're talking about, you know, many billions of these salamanders and that's just one species. And of course there's, there's hundreds uh, of species of these terrestrial salamanders, although the redback is, is certainly one of the most widespread, common and successful. So because they're so abundant and they spend a lot of their time underground, they spend by some estimates, 98% of their life underground. So when we find them under logs or rocks at the surface, you know, there's probably a hundred of them, you know, that we don't see that are under our feet. Um, they're super important to forest food webs, both as predators of uh, forest invertebrates and controlling, um, you know, those populations and being important parts uh, of the food web as a predator, but also important food for things higher on the food web, whether it be snakes or birds or mammals or whatever. Um, so they're ecologically important, I guess, is, is, is all the... Um, all I'm really trying to kind of get across here. And I want to show this picture because it's a great photo. <clears throat> okay, so to just dive right into our study. Um, we did an experimental study in the lab that I'll talk about at the end. And we did a field study at three different uh, local forests in my area here. Um, so of those three study sites, one was relatively intact and has comparatively few uh, invasive plants and two were very heavily invaded uh, sites where, especially in the forest understory, almost the entire understory was uh, invasive plants. <clears throat> so at each of these study sites, we established uh, 16 um, 10 by 10 meter plots, so 100 square meters. Um, and half of those were controls where we didn't um, control invasive plants in those plots at all. And the other half uh, were treatment plots where we removed uh, all the invasive plants at the beginning of the study. And that included, you know, herbaceous plants like, like garlic mustard and also, um, you know, the honeysuckle and the privet, um, which typically was cut at ground level and then treated with a small amount of herbicide, you know, to kill the stump and root system which was highly effective. And we had virtually no uh, grow back. Of course you have a seed bank, especially from garlic mustard. So every spring, this is this was a three year experiment from 2016 to 2018. Uh, every spring before the salamanders came out, we uh, went through the all the treatment plots uh, once or twice and did any additional control that was necessary, which was almost none to be honest. Um, and every plot, um, was, you know, we set them up and then we sat out there and flipped coins to decide which ones we were going to uh, control invasive plants at and which ones weren't. Okay, this is the huge advantage of experimental studies where we have true controls. Um, you can really assess cause and effect, right? You can really assess causality. Whereas if you do field studies, which I do lots of, and so I'm not trying to bash field studies, but if you're doing kind of like, okay, let's survey salamanders in this area of this forest uh, where there's a lot of invasive plants and let's survey salamanders with the same techniques in another part of the forest that has fewer invasive plants. Um, yeah, you might find something interesting there, but you know, you have no way of knowing whether any differences that you find might be due to the presence or absence or different densities of invasive plants or any number of other differences between those those two parts of the forest, right? Soil pH, soil moisture, canopy cover, you know, there's a million different possibilities, right? But when we do an experiment with explicit controls and replication and randomization and all that good stuff that I teach my, you know, students in our statistics class about, we really can assess cause and effect, uh, which is why we chose to take this approach. Okay, and this is just uh, a map of, of, of one of our study sites um, showing you um, the plots. So the green plots are treatment plots where we removed all the uh, invasive plants and, and the, the blue ones with the C's here are, are all of the controls. Again, it, 
is randomly assigned. So some are like controls are close to other controls. And so some controls are right next to treatments. I think there's a 25 meter minimum distance between uh, all these plots so that they weren't, you know, just all sampling sort of the same populations. Um, and these salamanders are small. They don't move around very much. Uh, redback salamanders, I think, have a, a lifetime um, territory size of like five square meters or something like that. They really, you know, they're homebodies. They don't get around too much. So we're pretty confident that that this each of these are pretty independent um, samples uh, from one another. Um, okay, so we set up these plots. We flipped a coin, decided which were treatments or which were controls randomly. We removed all the invasive plants from uh, the treatments. We put out cover boards, okay, which are just relatively small pieces of, of untreated pine lumber. You can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever. Um, and we put them in each plot, four cover boards in each plot. <clears throat> salamanders like to be understuffed. Uh, if you've ever been out in the woods looking for salamanders, your best bet is turning over you know, rocks, logs, um, pieces of bark in the leaf litter. You know, they, they don't like to be exposed. <clears throat> and that's actually going to be probably important later when we dive into the results here. Um, so the same exact cover board, same wood, same shape, same size, same thickness, same everything were put out in all the plots, control and treatment, in all the study sites. And then we waited for six months minimum. Because of course you come back the next day and you probably would find that there's no salamanders under our cover boards. Well, they have to find them, right? Uh, but once they do find them and once they weather a little bit, um, then they tend to be used uh, pretty commonly. And there's good evidence that they're pretty representative of what's actually there. Um, so once the six months had elapsed, um, we started sampling the cover boards, which is basically coming out and flipping them and seeing what's underneath. So we recorded um, what, if any, salamanders were under each cover board, uh, what, if any, earthworms were under each cover board, uh, because um, I don't know about on Long Island, but up here in Northern Ohio, we don't have any native earthworms. All the earthworms we have are non-native species, some from Europe, but also some of these Asian jumping types. Um, and, you know, worms spending a lot of time in the soil, salamanders spending a lot of time in the soil. We wanted to keep track of, of them as well. Um, and then we measured uh, leaf litter depth, soil temperature, and soil moisture using just some standard techniques and, and devices. Uh, at each um, at each cover board, and each cover board was sampled, uh, you know, on average about four times a year, twice in the spring and and, and twice in the fall. Uh, sometimes a little bit more or less than that, uh, but but that was the standard uh, 2016, 2017, 2018. So over the whole course of the experiment, we had flipped those cover boards 2,187 times, um, and that gave us. A lot of data to, to to go on. <clears throat> All right, so um, this is uh, I think a control uh, plot. I forget from which which of our study sites. I was just uh, threw this in here. Sorry, it's not a great photo, um, but you can see the cover boards there, sort of uh, you know, in the foreground middle middle part of the photograph there. That was probably right after we cut them because uh, those are. They gray and, and weather uh, pretty quickly. We even had to replace some before the end of the study because they decompose so badly that you flip them over and they just sort of fall apart. Um, but we had some like tree weathered ones, you know, sitting out in my backyard ready to go as replacements as things kind of decayed. Um, but that's sort of our main uh, sampling device there. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, this was published a couple of years ago, which is which is probably you know how you found out about it, and I got this invite in the first place. Um, so again, some of our major um, bad actors here uh, in our local area are are listed, all of which I've talked about, I guess, except for Multiflora Rose. Uh, and you can see that uh, the College of Worcester Golf Course Forest and Walton Woods, which is a local protected area, are very heavily invaded. Uh, especially with privet um, and uh, for some reason, burning bush at Walton Woods is super abundant there. Some of them have, you know, trunks as thick as my leg. <clears throat> 
um, and they really blot out the canopy and pretty much everything else. But Fern Valley um, is our field station here at the College of Worcester. And we've invested a lot of time and effort uh, over the last few decades, kind of making sure that um, invasive plants don't have too much of a, of a toehold there. Uh, so a lot of those ones that are common at the other sites are, are either absent or rare um, there at Fern Valley. Uh, but all of them did have invasive earthworms. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, despite the, the picture of the eastern redback salamander from earlier, uh, I'm actually not going to talk about the eastern redback salamander at all because uh, it didn't occur at any of our study sites. The, the common terrestrial salamander that we did have is a species that you don't have uh, there in New York. Uh, this is the northern ravine salamander, which only occurs in Ohio, uh, eastern Indiana, and western PA. <clears throat> Uh, it's closely related to the eastern redback salamander, but it's a distinct species. Um, so it's most of our captures came from this species, and so that's why I'm going to focus primarily on it. <clears throat> All right, so here's sort of the the money shot. Um, you know, this is this is one of the primary graphs that, that illustrate uh, the data here. So just to orient you, we got the three study sites on the x-axis here. Fern Valley is the intact one. The golf course forest and the Walton Woods are the ones that are heavily invaded by invasives. And then we just have the average uh, proportion of cover boards that were occupied by the Northern Ravine salamander um, in our study. Over, and this is pooled over all um, three years, 2016, 17, and 18. Um, so I guess the first thing to notice is that, um, and these error bars for the statistically minded are two standard errors. Uh, it's essentially equivalent to a 95% confidence interval. You can see here at Fern Valley, you know, the um, the treatment boards. So where we remove the, the invasive plants in those plots, those are the gray bars um, at Fern Valley we had um, pretty similar amounts of, of cover boards having northern ravine salamanders found underneath them in both the controls where we didn't remove uh, invasive plants and the treatments where we did remove the invasive plants. And you wouldn't be surprised to know that there's no statistical difference there at Fern Valley between kind of the occurrence of, of these salamanders between uh, the control and the treatment. Now that's a fairly intact site, meaning there's not a ton of uh, invasives there. So we didn't have to do a lot of heavy lifting to, to remove invasives from the treatment plants, from the treatment plots, because uh, there wasn't a lot of invasives to start with. But the other two sites are heavily invaded. So we did have to do a lot of heavy lifting um, in those treatment plots at those sites uh, to remove them. And I should, I should say, um, you know, our assumption, our, I shouldn't say assumption. Our hypothesis at the at the outset of this was that the removal of invasive plants from these plots would benefit the salamanders. Okay, that the treatment plots would have increased abundance over time, over the course of this three year study. Um, in the treatment plots where we removed the invasive plants, and you can see here it was the exact opposite. The treatment plants, the treatment plots, rather, where we removed all the invasive plants, had dramatically fewer um, salamanders compared to the controls who still had all of their invasive plants at these two heavily invaded uh, sites. I mean, it was particularly dramatic uh, in uh, the College of Worcester golf course. I don't know what that kind of works out to, like five or six times more salamanders in the invade the invaded plots as compared to the ones where um, the invasive plants had been removed. So this was, you know, pretty shocking uh, to us, to be honest with you, uh, initially. And we saw the same pattern at Walton Woods, even though there were fewer salamanders there overall. And so, um, yeah, this far from there being a positive effect of removing uh, all the invasive plants and, and, you know, thinking about my service on the board of our local park, um, you know, we do this all the time, you know, removing, we have invasive plant removal crews going out there uh, 
you know, removing invasive plants, you know, on a regular basis. And so now I wonder um, about the impacts. Um, now, does this probably have some demonstrably positive, uh, positive impacts on our native plants? Almost certainly. Although, you know, we don't have direct evidence for that. There's certainly evidence out there in the literature um, from, from other studies and other uh, investigators on that. But maybe we have a pretty uh, strong unintended negative effect of invasive plant removal uh, here in this experiment. Um, and again, from a statistical standpoint, and, and if you want to talk more about this, once we get to the questions, I can dive into the details, but we not only did some kind of fairly classic statistical analysis here, but also something called occupancy modeling, which kind of helps you kind of correct for the fact that, you know, things that are there, you don't always find because detection probability is less than one, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, however we looked at this, there was a strong difference among study sites in the relative abundance uh, of northern ravine salamanders, again, which in a lot of places in our local area are the dominant terrestrial salamander. And there was also a strong, strong statistical difference between control and treatment um, uh, plots. And in the heavily invaded sites, it was dramatically lower salamanders in places where we removed the invasive plants. Mm -hmm. um, let me go on to some of the more environmental data that we collected. Um, so this is the soil surface temperature stuff, um, just looking at the averages. Uh, this is, you know, all sites, all years. Um, those are 95% confidence intervals in the error bars, again, for the statistically minded. You wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, for me to tell you that there's no was no difference whatsoever in soil temperature between uh, the control plots and the invasive removal plots at any of the study sites. And the same thing was true for leaf litter. Uh, we see some differences among sites overall, um, but no difference between uh, controls and invasive removal plots um, in the different study sites for leaf litter depth. There was strong difference, however, in the average soil moisture uh, between controls and the invasive removal plots. And we thought, aha, okay, so maybe um, the removal of the invasives changes the soil moisture somehow, and, and that um, when we were first getting the initial data before we realized that, that the salamanders were actually fleeing um, the invasive removal plots, we thought this might actually help explain the results, but it really doesn't because the invasive removal plots have significantly higher moisture content in the soil than the control plots. And that is going to be good for the salamanders. Salamanders love moisture, right? We all know that much. Um, this should make the salamanders seek out the invasive removal plots, not flee from them. Um, we figure that this is probably due to the fact that, you know, the shrub density in a lot of these plots, especially with privet, and uh, honeysuckle and burning bush got pretty dense in some areas. You remove all those and those, so they're not, you know, photosynthesizing, they're not sucking uh, water out of the soil to conduct photosynthesis and transpire some of that um, water, you know, out of their leaves uh, because we've removed them, you know, then there's more moisture that stays in the soil because the these invasive plants aren't sucking it up. So it makes sense that there would be higher moisture in the invasive removal plots. Um, so you'd think that the amphibians would like the invasive removal plots because they're moisture, but in fact, there were dramatically fewer of them <clears throat> in those removal plots. So we kind of scratched our heads about that for, for a little while. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, not to... Um, just to make sure we we have uh, enough time for kind of some Q and A, you know, I kind of cut to the chase here a little bit. Uh, but you know, our data, you know, from an actual multi-year experiment, suggests that invasive plant removal reduces 
what we'll call salamander occupancy. So they're not necessarily, this isn't like killing salamanders, um, they're just leaving. Um, it's making the habitat less suitable for them in some way. And so they're, they're going to adjacent places uh, compared to controls, uh, which again, at the same study sites, same characteristics and everything, again, randomly kind of chosen. Um, the only difference is we didn't remove the invasive plants um, and they had a lot more salamanders in those, at those heavily uh, invaded sites. So the impact varied among sites. Again, at Fern Valley, that doesn't have that many invasives to begin with. There wasn't that much of an effect, really statistically speaking, no effect, but there was a huge effect um, at the most heavily invaded sites. <clears throat> okay, let me briefly tell you about the experimental study that we did in the lab, um, which is a little less consequential uh, probably for uh, for your purposes, um, but nonetheless is sort of an interesting side story here. So this had to do uh, with a different species of of salamander called the northern two line salamander. Um, and what we did was we captured a bunch of these uh, salamanders from yeah the fourth study site because we didn't want to be taking salamanders from the areas that we were actively doing this you know our invasive removal from. And what we did was we bought these huge petri dishes that are like I don't know. Are like almost a foot wide so there's you know a good amount of area there and we lined it with filter paper uh, and the filter paper was either uh, saturated with um, kind of just tap water or invasive plant extracts you know from ground up roots that we extracted and filtered or uh, from native plant uh, root extracts um, that we you know ground up the roots and extracted in, in the same sort of way so we set up these petri dishes again with one part of the petri dish with invasive plant, um, invasive root extracts, um, another part of the petri dish with filter paper that has native plant extracts, and then another part of the petri dish that has filter paper uh, on the bottom of it that just had a plain water control. Um, we pushed record on a video recording system, left the room. And I think they were a half hour long with like a five minute acclimation period. And then we just, uh, my students, you know, mind numbingly watched all these videos uh, to just record how much time the salamanders were spending in the three different uh, areas of, of the, the trial. And, and again, this is the Northern uh, two line salamander, uh, which is another fairly common one in our area. Although this one does breed, it does have a larval stage and breeds in streams. Um, it's not a pond breeder. It's a fairly small salamander, but it is uh, pretty abundant around here. Uh, does have a larval stage. But what we found uh, with its behavior is that, and we used two different invasives um, where we ground up their their roots and extracted, you know, all the whatever's in there. Um, <clears throat> They didn't seem to care what kind of plant extracts were on the petri dishes, whether it was a native or an invasive or which invasive it was. The time that they spent on that part of the petri dish was almost exactly one third, which is exactly what you would expect if they're essentially just randomly walking around and not spending any particular different amount of time anywhere. Uh, although they did spend a slightly higher and, you know, significantly higher amount of time on the plain water control as compared to all the others. But the important part of this is just that they didn't disfavor uh, the invasive plant extracts compared to the native ones. There was no preference. <clears throat> okay, so that suggested, and, and I should have said, you know, these salamanders spend a lot of time in the soil, uh, in the shallow soil, and so they are gonna be spending a lot of time in contact with roots and the various chemicals that we know roots exude, both from native plants and from you know, invasive plants. And so, you know, if we're thinking about potential invasive plant impacts on salamanders, you could think there could be a chemical one as well, right? I mean, is there any evidence that they avoid, um, you know, the exudates of, of, of invasive plant, uh, invasive root uh, chemicals? And at least with this one, um, species under the uh, trials that we did using those particular species of plants, we didn't find any evidence of that. Of course, it doesn't mean that there isn't any, um, but maybe we just didn't pick the right ones or whatever. 
Um, but again, no, no evidence there of, of any big impacts <clears throat> or any, any impact at all, really. So to go back to the fundamental question here that was in my title slide, does invasive species control and, and invasive plant removal is what we're talking about in this particular case, does that have unintentional negative impacts on salamanders? And I think we have to say, yeah. It does. Um, I mean, you really, I think, can explain our results it's because it was an experiment um, with controls and multi-year data and, and all the rest. Um, I don't know that there's any other conceivable way to interpret our data, um, <clears throat> which um, my uh, kind of invasive plant crews out at our local park, they didn't really want to hear that. Um, I mean, they didn't disbelieve it, but now what they've been spending so much sweat equity doing over, in some cases, many years, um, now they have to wonder, was, was that the right thing to do? Um, so given the ecological importance and abundance of terrestrial salamanders in eastern forests, should we stop control invas uh, controlling invasive plants? I mean, I'd say no. Um, we know that, I mean, we don't always know no, like we haven't done like, you know, a multi-year experiment to unambiguously demonstrate it. But I think there is that data out there. And a lot of times we know kind of in our gut, you know, that what we're doing does have benefits to other native species. It's just that some of this seems to have unintentional negative effects on other native So what I would say is that let's continue, um, you know, removing invasive plants in eastern forests to benefit some of our, our native plants especially. But if we want to mitigate this negative impact on salamanders, which, you know, to my knowledge, this is the first experimental study to look at this. So maybe as more data comes in, we find out, well, actually, this is specific to northern ravine salamanders. I, su I suspect that's not the case. I suspect that this is probably pretty general to a lot of different salamander species in a lot of different areas. Um, but if we at least for the time being make the generalizing assumption that that this is, you know, applicable beyond just um, my particular area in this particular species, then we might need to think about not just pulling invasives and walking away, which is what you know I've done on garlic mustard poles and and lots of people you know who I call friends and and work with uh, at our local park do all the time. Um, so maybe we need to not just walk away, but pull invasives and plant plant back natives to restore that uh, shrub layer uh, with some native plants. And we have um, started um, a follow-up study to look, to look at that. So if we remove, um, so we have some controls where we don't do anything. We have some uh, other treatment plots where we remove invasives and then don't do anything, which is sort of the status quo, at least around here. And then we have other plots where we remove invasives, but then plant back natives. <clears throat> And we chose arrowwood and spice bush, which are somewhat common understory shrubs, at least where you don't have total uh, dominance by the invasives that deer don't love, uh, so that, which is why we chose them, or at least the literature says that deer don't love them. Um, I don't have any data to uh, present on that study because it turns out that the deer are still happy to eat them. Um, and so the project never really got off the ground because within just a few months of planting, virtually all of our native plants planted back were browsed to the ground by deer and gun. So um, <clears throat> that is a further wrinkle in all this, right? That, you know, if you do pull invasives and plant natives, you probably just can't plant natives and walk away either. You got to protect them from deer, at least if you're in such a deer heavy uh, environment like we are here in Ohio. <clears throat> okay. And of course, I'm just looking at salamanders. One of my students did some rudimentary looking at uh, forest floor invertebrates, you know, snails, beetles, things like that. 
um, but we really don't have there, you know, and there was no initial difference um, just with one year of data. Nobody ended up following up on that. But, you know, it was one of these studies that was looking at like all beetles combined, uh, which, you know, is probably not going to be super useful because if you don't actually identify them down to genus or species, you're really kind of getting a really super rough look at things. <clears throat> okay. And if you want, you know, more detailed information about the study, you know, uh, it, it's great kind of, you know, bedside reading, put you to sleep uh, really readily. Uh, but we do have a paper that came out in the Journal of Herpetology a couple of years ago, about a year and a half ago, I guess, um, on the full details of the study. So um, with that, I'd be happy to kind of take any, any questions that you might have and I guess I'll stop sharing so that if we choose to, we can see each other. Thank you, Rick. Very interesting, fascinating study. Thanks. Uh, your students are lucky to get to work on stuff like that. It's good. We do have a couple of questions. You And you did touch upon uh, the control, but uh, how were the invasives controlled? For example, were they mechanically pulled or hand pulled or cut? How were they? Yeah, so everything was hand pulled if we could hand pull it. Uh, there was no, you know, we didn't use any heavy equipment. Um, there was no digging uh, uh, in the soil, even with shovels or anything. So hand pulled if it could be hand pulled. If it couldn't be hand pulled, we cut it off at ground level and treated um, with an herbicide um, to to kill, to keep it from sprouting back, uh, which I think I mentioned was really, really effective. I think we had almost zero sprout back um, where we removed them. And, you know, we really didn't want to do any like foliar spraying of herbicides because, you know, that would have used a lot more herbicide than just a stump tree. Um, we estimated at the end of the day that we used um, about 25 milliliters of herbicide one time in each uh, treatment plot over the entire course of the study. Uh, so that's a really small amount of herbicide. Again, it was done before salamanders emerged from you know, winter hibernation um, and, it, and it just occurred in that first year. So in the statistical analysis that I didn't show you, we really kind of were careful to look for any year effects because um, if there was any potential impact of the herbicide treatment of the stumps, um, that could be kind of a confounding factor, right, into why we were seeing kind of treatment differences between controls and invasive removal plots. Um, but there was no difference among years, um, suggesting that, you know, the salamanders didn't like leave the plots because of the herbicide and then come back in, in subsequent years, because these things have half-lives of just a couple of weeks, right? So um, so we, we've, we, I think we have uh, good at least circumstantial evidence that the herbicide application um, isn't a really good explanation for, for the results that we found. But that's that's how the control happened. All right, great. Now we have a question about deer, so expanding on deer a bit. Are, are deer a driving force in the invaded areas, say versus an area that's not invaded? And are they having an impact uh, whether the plants are native or not native and et cetera. Yeah, I mean, deer are a huge issue here. Um, I'm involved in a in a committee at the park that, that I, I work at that I mentioned. It's Worcester Memorial Park, if you want to Google it up. But uh, we're starting down the road of a potential deer control program. Um, but before we do that, we're doing some deer censuses to just see what we have. Um, and I'm not an expert in this area, but I'm starting to become one because, you know, with this committee work, I'm starting to you know, figure out what the state of the art is in terms of deer surveys. A lot of people in recent years have used like just trail cameras, you know, game cameras to, to get decent numbers on these kind of things. And that seems to be pretty effective, but people are using thermal drones now. Um, especially in the winter when there's no uh, leaf cover, obviously, that can actually be really effective and pretty much seeing everything um, deer size that's down there. Um, and so some of our initial numbers are showing that we've got um, 
you know, 150 to 250 deer per square mile uh, in our area, which is, you know, our Ohio Department of Natural Resources says that like maybe about 15 to 40 white-tailed deer per square yeah. mile is healthy. And so yeah. we have like, you know, basically an order of magnitude more than that. Um, and we're doing some exclusion fences here and there and stuff to try and quantify the impact and stuff. But yeah, we've got a ton of deer and it can right. not be having an impact. Yeah. Have you ever thought about whether the deer exclusion fences would benefit salamanders? Yeah. And we're hoping to, you know, this spring, we're going to be, uh, you know, putting up uh, some deer exclusion fences out there and, you know, whether we're going to be doing it on a large enough scale where we'd be able to get enough numbers to really kind of, you know, kind of show the differences. I mean, a lot of my colleagues are kind of doing this more for educational purposes than than for kind of scientific purposes per se. Because uh, you know, if if you're if you're going to claim that like, hey, deer control helps salamanders, which honestly, if I had to guess, I'd say that's probably true. Um, but I haven't really seen any studies that have really convincingly demonstrated that um, <clears throat> because, you know, these deer exclusion fences, the deer might not be able to get through, but the salamanders are going to be able to get through no problem. Um, I would guess that that, that, that is probably going to have a, a substantial positive impact uh, on salamander populations because not only are going to be benefiting the native plants, um, it's going to create, um, you know, cover, uh, the shrub layer cover, and ground layer cover that is often so lacking in our more park-like forests that deer, deer have been browsing down for so long. I mean, it's nice when you go hiking, you can kind of see all around and the big trees. And I mean, it's that park-like kind of look to our forest, though I don't think it's very actually natural. Um, that shrub layer is just kind of completely gone and that has a big effect on ground nesting birds, on salamanders, on, on lots of things we could talk about. Yeah. So I can't say anything definitive, I guess, because we okay. haven't done studies yet. But but my sense would be that deer control, whether that be kind of, uh, you know, via hunting or by deer exclusion or, you know, you know, people even I think when they have the money to do so, even like, you know, basically do a, a birth control kind of thing with the does. Um, I think that is likely to have a positive impact in a lot of cases. Okay. All right. I had a question about soil. Did you observe changes or differences in soil between the different plots, texture, structure, anything like that? Yeah, good question. Uh, we didn't really do um, much soil stuff in the study. We probably should have. Um, nonetheless, at least in terms of explaining the kind of dramatic salamander differences between control and treatment plots, because they were randomly assigned, right. you know, there's there's little chance that like there's systematic soil differences between control right. and treatment. But it would be interesting to know, you know, what the impact of uh, you know invasive removal has on soil properties, uh, which is something that we could we could look at, but we haven't yet. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like this could lead to a lot more research or more you know more good research for your students so it's pretty cool yeah. any other questions anybody oh okay. abby has her hand up go abby did you see any interactions uh in the worms that you found and salamanders yeah i thought somebody was going to ask that um <laughs> so there is kind of mirroring the, the invasive plants um <clears throat> Our relatively intact site had invasive worms, but occurred at a pretty low uh, density. And the more heavily invaded sites had higher uh, earthworm densities. And other people have documented this as well. It seems like the invasive plants tend to facilitate the, the invasive earthworms or vice versa. Um, and there have been studies that have looked at redback salamanders that have basically shown that um, and this wasn't an experimental study. Uh, this was published in Conservation Biology about a decade ago, um, actually by some people at Syracuse, I think, um, if I'm remembering right, that there was a strong negative association between redback salamanders and, and earthworm, uh, you know, invasive earthworm abundance. 
and that the correlation was sort of weaker with invasive plants. And so the thought was it was really the invasive earthworms that were sort of driving the decreases in abundance in the salamanders and not so much the uh, the invasive uh, plants. But again, that was an observational study, not an experimental one. Um, so we were expecting to see a similar kind of, I guess, you know, when we had cover boards that had lots of invasive earthworms under them, that there would be sort of a reduced occurrence uh, of salamanders. Um, and actually, we did not find that, um, that there was statistically no difference in um, the occurrence of northern ravine salamanders, which is the species that we had the largest sample of, um, and the occurrence of worms, kind of regardless of how we looked at it, whether it was just presence absence of worms or whether we divide up in like no worms, low worms, high worms, however we looked at it, there was no difference, uh, which was surprising, um, which suggests, again, because there's other papers in the literature that show that redbacks have a real strong negative aversion to at least some of these invasive earthworms. I mean, that seems to be pretty well established at this point, but a closely related species, the northern reed salamander, apparently doesn't have any aversion to them at all. And we will actually commonly find them together under the same cover boards. I mean, not necessarily playing kissy face, but, you know, under the same cover boards, just hanging out together. Um, so, you know, that's one of the kind of, kind of, amazing and cool things about ecology and the frustrating things about ecology at the same time, right, is that you don't, you know, every kind of little part of the natural world that you that you unravel, you know, you, you sometimes figure out that like, well, this is actually only specific to this certain pair of species and you can't generalize beyond that. Um, so yeah, keeps us busy though. Job okay. security. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. All right, thank no you. Problem. And uh, Steve Young, one of our participants, is uh, looking forward to study, looking forward to a study after deer fencing, if you ever do that someday, or someone ever does it, to see if that has an impact on the control and whether that difference might make the control good for salamanders or so. Yeah, yeah, I think some that interesting would be stuff to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like I said, job security, a lot, lot of yes, studies yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I well, I, yeah, yeah, I appreciate your. Um, I think that's it for the invitation, and, and thanks for the questions. And have a great day. Enjoy the weather. Thank you very much for your time. That was excellent. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you.